Hello, everyone. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Terry Moran. We got breaking news at this hour. All 12 remaining hostages in Haiti have been released, according to Haitian officials. The group of 17 missionaries from Christian Aid Ministries in Ohio were kidnapped in October. Five of the hostages had already been released before today. The leader of the 400 Mawozo gang that captured them had demanded a million dollars in ransom for each hostage. No word yet on the missionaries' condition or their current whereabouts. We'll continue to follow this fast-developing story. At least 21 tornadoes were reported across the heartland overnight. Minnesota had its first-ever December tornado. The town of Heartland, 95 miles south of Minneapolis, took a direct hit. And now that powerful storm is on the move, and it's heading toward the region that's already been devastated by that massive deadly tornado outbreak last weekend. Authorities are investigating the deadly plane crash in the Dominican Republic that killed all nine people on board, including Puerto Rican music producer Flo La Movie. The company that owned the private plane says the 38-year-old producer, whose real name is Jose Angel uh, Hernandez, has and his partner and their four-year-old child were all among the casualties, along with other relatives and colleagues and the two crew members. The company says the Gulfstream jet was just minutes into its flight to Florida before the tragic crash. The airport operator says the plane was trying to make an emergency landing. And an influential scholar, poet, and activist, Bell Hooks, whose groundbreaking work explored the intersection of race, gender, and class, has died. She was the author of dozens of wide-ranging books and the recipient of many top awards. Her later work focused on the transformative power of love. Bell Hooks passed away in her home after an extended illness at just 69 years old. Well, now to warnings over Omicron. The new COVID variant is spreading fast across the U.S. and the world, and cases and hospitalizations are on the rise in some parts of the country. Steve Osinsami has the latest. Health officials say that the risk of getting sick with COVID is going up just as families are about to get together indoors for the end of the year holidays. The government reports that we're now up to 118,000 new cases a day, and that's 45% more than just last month. The director of the CDC says she worries that this new variant that's more transmissible will push these numbers even higher. We expect to see the proportion of Omicron cases here in the United States continue to grow in the coming weeks. Scientists at the CDC watching the spread of this new strain are reportedly discussing two possible futures, a possible peak in cases after the holidays by as soon as mid-January, and another moderate rise later in the spring. NYU and Princeton are a few of the universities already canceling year-end events like holiday parties in the name of safety. And at George Washington University in D.C. and at Cornell in New York, they're moving all final exams from in-person to online. For the nation's seniors, officials say the booster shots are still very important. The rate of getting the disease was 10 times lower with seniors who got the extra dose versus people their same age who didn't get a booster or weren't vaccinated at all. Given the increase in transmissibility, this also means continuing to be vigilant about masking in public indoor settings in areas of substantial or high community transmission. And as of now, this represents about 90% of all counties in the United States. Another encouraging sign, the government is reporting that an average of a million Americans each day are getting their booster shots. Terry? Well, that's some good news. Steve Osinsami, thanks very much for that. And new autopsy results this week showed a former NFL player who police say gunned down six people in April had CTE, that's a brain disease caused by repeated head trauma. Philip Adams spent 21 years playing tackle football starting at seven years old. And he was drafted by the San Francisco 49ers in 2010. He died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound after allegedly carrying out the mass shooting. We're also learning more about the tragic death of former football star Vincent Jackson. He died back in February. Juju Chang sat down with his widow, who is opening up for the first time and revealing a stunning CTE diagnosis there. Take a look. Vincent was um, an amazing dad. He would do anything for his kids. Danny held up his dog tags and a smile. My dad's in the army. From the outside, Vincent appeared to be acing life after a storied NFL career. But Lindsay says for years, her husband suffered with memory loss, erratic behavior, and kept turning to alcohol. He shared with me once that um, 
alcohol made him feel calm and made him feel like himself and that his brain was really fuzzy and that this made it not fuzzy. The couple decided they needed a break. He was living at a hotel as his family grew increasingly concerned about his mental health. Then Vincent was found dead. That's a hard day. We uh, had the sheriff come to our house and let us know. And I had been telling the kids and letting them know that dad was really sick and he's, go he's gonna get better and he's gonna be back. And here they are in our living room and telling us that's not the case. Looking for answers, the family decided to donate his brain to researchers at Boston University's CTE Center. The shocking results being revealed. Vincent had stage 2 CTE. Shocking for them because he'd never been diagnosed with a concussion during his 12 seasons as a wide receiver in the NFL. I'm imagining that everything clicked at that moment. Yeah, it all made sense. He didn't know he had it and I think had he known he wouldn't have felt so ashamed or alone no one should have to die in a room by himself Dr. Anne McKee is the foremost researcher of CTE the neuropathologist diagnosed Vincent his was stage two because he had multiple areas of the brain that were affected on both sides of the brain. They may have violent behaviors, either physically or verbally. They're often depressed and moody. Dr. McKee says there's too much focus on concussions, not enough on the cumulative effects of head trauma over years. The NFL needs to overhaul their awareness campaign to concentrate on repetitive head hits that don't rise to the level of concussion. In a statement provided to ABC News, the NFL said in part, we continue to mourn with the family of Vincent Jackson. There is more to learn about head injury and related illness. And while the NFL is funding that important work, we also continue to make tangible progress in protecting players and making our game safer. It's why Lindsay is sharing her story in the hopes it could raise awareness, helping other families connect the dots. It would have explained why he was so sick. In his mind, it would have explained why he couldn't fix anything just tragic and there are many stories like that out of professional sports out of the military and elsewhere thanks to juju for that uh, vincent jackson's family tells us the final autopsy report will be out today and you can see more of juju's report tonight on nightline and we would now like to bring in you just heard her in the piece cte researcher and neuropathologist dr ann mckee uh, Aunt, Dr. Ann, uh, Dr. McKee, I should say, thank you so much for being with us. It's such an important, important subject uh, for football players, but for so many people who, whose work or, or accidents lead them you know, to have uh, these kinds of head injuries. So first, the question, because following a, a lot of this over the years, there are football players in the past who have all of a sudden turned violent. Some of them have taken their own lives. Junior Seo, I'm thinking of. Why can C CTE lead to violent behaviors? Uh, you know, as we've seen in these cases. So uh, there's a lot of uh, pathology in the frontal lobes, which controls impulse control. It also affects uh, problem solving and judgment. Uh, these guys are often depressed. They've got rage behaviors, a short fuse. So just a little infraction makes them go off the handle. And all of these symptoms converge uh, to make them more irrational, uh, more unlovable. It's like Vincent Jackson, he couldn't stay with his family because of, you know, these, these behaviors that he was having. And then they become socially isolated, which just makes their life uh, even worse. Uh, so it's, it's the combination of frontal lobe pathology and its connections that leads to these very serious behaviors in these guys. It's so sad, Dr. McKee. How can it be diagnosed? Is the autopsy the only way that you really know? Well, the autopsy is the only way we can definitively know. But we are working, I would say, every day on how to diagnose this during life. And we're getting a lot closer. We've got something called tau PET imaging, where you can actually take a scan of the brain and look for tau in the brain. Right now, it's not good enough, it's not specific enough, uh, but we're working on new markers, new tracers, and if, as those get developed, they, they'll get more and more specific for CTE. We're looking at blood biomarkers and CSF biomarkers, uh, and you know, there's new developments every day. What we're doing now is just honing down on the specificity so that when we have 
this collection of changes, we can be sure that it's CTE. Right now we can diagnose it or we can suspect it. We can say it's possible, we can say it's probable, but we can't definitively say it's there. All right, so the, the NFL doctor has instituted new protocols and rule changes, all, all the fans know it, to help protect players, including penalties for helmet, to helmet hits. I've got a little boy, he's playing flag football, he loves football. Is there, in your judgment, a safe way to play tackle football, or, or, or is that just a game that is too dangerous for the brain? Well, it's the cumulative small hits that are part of tackle football. It's a collision sport. There's collisions for nearly every player on every on every uh, play of the game. And it's a cumulative uh, 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 number of hits that turns out to be what triggers CTE. So you can play tackle football, but you'd have to monitor the number of hits each player was experiencing and limit that number of hits to some uh, as yet unidentified number. But right now we're not paying any attention to the number of hits that are going on on the playing field. Uh, we're, we're only addressing concussion, which is part of the problem, but not the major problem in football. It's the duration of their playing career or, or the number of sub-concussive hits that is correlated with risk and severity for CTE. And right now, uh, for every year of football, your risk goes up 30%. Mm, wow. It's a game so many of us love, but not worth what we're seeing in these players. And Dr. Ann McKee, we thank you for your work on this, and thank you for coming uh, here and explaining it to us. Thank you for having me. Well, coming up, our Ian panel is back in Afghanistan. He's a great reporter, and he's several months there uh, after the Taliban reclaimed power. He's back. The growing hunger crisis there. Ian, on the line, front lines there when we come back. Welcome back. Four months after the messy U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, a mix of sanctions and drought and terrorism has brought that country once again to the brink of collapse. Our senior foreign correspondent, Ian Panel, is back in the country, and what he found is a humanitarian crisis that is growing by the day. Welcome to the new Afghanistan. <laughs> where Taliban flags flutter over the city markets and murals with the slogans, with the help of God, our nation defeated America, painted along the city walls. But four months after the US withdrawal, the country's collapsing before our eyes, whether or not we choose to see it. The militants who took over are struggling to control a growing ISIS insurgency and a rapidly unfolding humanitarian crisis. The last time we were at Kabul airport, it was controlled by the US military. But today, it's these fighters, the Taliban, armed with US-made M4 rifles. However, having forced the Americans and NATO to withdraw from the country, they're now having to battle an insurgency of their own against ISIS. We sat down with Taliban Badri commander Malawi Mohammed Salim Saad to discuss their looming crisis. What is the problem here? Why are things so bad right now? No, it needs more time. We will have a good government, but it needs more time. The economy's tanking. Banks are closed or limiting access to funds. Foreign aid from the US, Europe and others that kept the country afloat has largely been frozen. <laughs> Salaries are unpaid and unemployment is through the roof. Men like Jawad are reduced to ruin. A former student at Kabul University, he's been waiting outside every day for the past three months, hoping just to get some work. At night, I am crying. Because of that, that there is no one to listen to us. What should I do? I don't know about my future. Mass unemployment exacerbates a growing hunger crisis. Thousands of Afghans line up throughout Kabul for food, like this former shop owner. It's his third time coming to this food distribution center. According to the UN, as many as 90% of the population could face poverty by next year. 
But hunger and starvation are already here. According to the UN, 55% of the population faces extreme levels of hunger. And for one of its most vulnerable populations, children, they warn one million could starve to death this winter. The Indira Gandhi Hospital is the only one in the country dedicated to caring for children. Its wards are now overrun with malnourished children. Emaciated and sick, with bloated bellies and limbs, so young and yet already fighting for their lives. It's difficult to watch, but their lives may depend on the world not turning away. This hospital was completely reliant on foreign aid, but international communities are refusing to provide financial assistance directly to the Taliban, and it's the weakest who suffer the most. And toddlers like Mohammed Chakri are unable to get the treatment they need. Little Mohammed here is absolutely tiny. He's two years old. He weighs just about 11 to 12 pounds. He should weigh something much closer to around 30. He's just skin and bone. His mother doesn't have the money to get the medicine that he needs. And the UN says it's about to get much worse. Some staff have even used their own money to help pay for patient fees. But many hospital workers have also gone without salaries for four months. And they too are desperate for money. One of the reasons assets are frozen is the Taliban's treatment of women and girls. Many women have been forced out of their jobs and of the 4.2 million young Afghans already out of school, 60% of them are girls. The mural on the wall outside the now closed Ministry for Women says it all. Black paint sprayed over the mouth of a woman daring to proclaim freedom. Zahra Nabi is a journalist in Kabul. She used to have a staff of 50 at her studios. But since the Taliban took over, she's the last one still working. Zahra spends her time documenting the untold stories of women around the country. Explain why you didn't leave. For me, it's really boring to sit in somewhere and just wait. And it's really kill me. It's better to be in the field of war instead of to sit at some peace place and just watching what's going on. It's really, it's really, for me, it's really hard. Afghanistan's her homeland. And despite the dangers and being offered a visa in Europe, she refuses to leave. I really worked very hard, hard to achieve this, you know, at least. The, the community will accept me. So I, it, it couldn't make me like only these things. It couldn't make me go back. But for most women, like Satara, their dreams are dead. And working and studying now remains out of the question. This was your show? Yes. Satara used to be an anchor for a local news channel, Bano TV. It was shut down when the Taliban came to town. One day you will do this again. No, I don't think so. I told them that if it's all about it, رسانه ما کاملا بسته شد همه گی تیتو پراغنده شدن دیگه فکر نمی کنم که ما به روزای خود دوباره بر بگردم Satara and her 13 year old sister Zahra who was deemed too old to go to school are now trapped inside their home rarely venturing out anymore and playing with her friends now a thing of the past What would you say to children your age elsewhere in the world What would you tell them about what life is like in Afghanistan today احساس می است که why is that your message? But in a rare act of defiance, some underground schools are springing up. Classes being held in secret. Even in the darkness, a small light still glows. This is an incredible thing to witness. There are a dozen girls here, all teenagers. At the moment, they're doing math. They're also learning English. The kind of things that everyone's kids take for granted. The only way they can do it is by doing it in secret, in private, and risking the wrath of the Taliban. This is illegal. Why are you running a school and risking everything? Are you worried by coming to school? A little, because of Taliban. 
but why do you come? I want to become a good doctor in the future and I want to continue my education uh, because uh, when fall old government and become new regime to now schools uh, are closed and girls cannot go to school, uh, of, of course uh, we want to read. But hope is a dwindling force here as the weather closes in and hunger stalks the land. For many, the winter ahead promises to be a long, dark and desperate battle simply to stay alive. Ian Panel with extraordinary reporting there from Afghanistan. Thank you very much. And we'll be right back. Welcome back to ABC News Live. All week here, our friend and fellow ABC News Live anchor, Diane Macedo, sharing her tips to getting better sleep. She did a deep dive on this subject in her new book, The Sleep Fix, which is out now. And yesterday, we we're talking to Diane about what to do when our circadian rhythm, that's our body clock, keeps us awake. Today, we want to talk about insomnia. So, Diane is back. Great to see you, Diane. Hi, Terry. Thanks for having me. You, you look well rested, and, and, and let's talk about insomnia. So you say insomnia also kept you awake in addition to, you know, uh, other things. So what's the difference? What is insomnia? So insomnia is, is, is the most simple definition I can give you. It's when you fall asleep, can't fall asleep or can't stay asleep or have trouble doing those things for no apparent reason. So if you ever lay down and you can't sleep because you just can't stop thinking, that is essentially insomnia. And there are some sleep experts classify circadian rhythm disorders as a type of insomnia, others don't. I prefer to keep them separate because they really have separate root causes and as a result they have separate solutions. So what are the causes of insomnia? So things like stress, excitement, uh, anxiety, all those things power up your wake drive. And so if you're particularly stressed or excited about something, that can power up your wake drive enough that it overwhelms your sleep drive. And now you have trouble sleeping. Now, if it happens every now and then, that's completely normal. It happens every now and then to pretty much everyone. The problem is some of us then start really worrying about the fact that we are not sleeping. And so then those worries keep you awake. And a lot of us then also try to make up for that sleep loss by sleeping in, napping, or going to bed early. And now you've depleted your sleep drive. So now it's even harder to fall asleep. And if you do this long enough and you spend enough time awake and worrying in bed, your brain starts to form an association that bed is where we stay awake and worry. And so some people will identify with that experience where you're dozing off on the couch and you immediately go to bed, and as soon as you get to bed, you're suddenly wide awake. It's because your brain has learned that bed is where we stay awake and worry, and bed has become a cue for wakefulness. So you have to divorce that association in order to really fix your insomnia. That sounds very familiar to different passages in my life, no question. Uh, you know, where, you, where you've got something on your mind, there's some issue in your life or whatever, uh, and then you begin to associate, you wake up in the middle of the night, that time is the time you're going to worry. So what are some of your tips for insomnia, for getting out, out of that box? So I think one is a worry list or, or a brain dump. You essentially take a notebook, divide the page down the center, write all your worries on the left-hand side of the page before you go to bed, and on the right-hand side, you write down just the very next step to resolving that issue. And if there is no resolution, just write accept and move on. But you don't even, even know, need to know the ultimate solution. Just the very next step you can do to move that issue in the right direction. The other tip I like is to enjoy your wake time because so many of us fear so much, oh God, I hope I don't wake up tonight, that that becomes a threat and our body then deals with it as a threat by triggering our flight or fright response. And that's part of the reason we have so much trouble falling back asleep if we wake up at night. So do something enjoyable and relaxing. Obviously, you don't want to do something that's too stimulating, but enjoyable and relaxing. If you're in bed ever long enough to feel frustrated, get out of bed and do something enjoyable and relaxing. Go back to bed when you feel sleepy. I like listening to an audiobook or podcast sometimes if I have trouble sleeping and see if that works. Set it on a sleep timer. You also want to try setting a reverse curfew, which is when you say, I won't go to bed until X time, which sounds kind of weird, mm -hmm. but by challenging yourself to stay awake instead of forcing yourself to go to sleep, you can sometimes reverse the anxiety that fuels insomnia. And finally, Always, always, you can just go see a sleep specialist who's trained to do all of this for you. That is always the ultimate solution. Well, th th those sound practical and useful, and I'm probably going to try out a couple of those for sure. The worry list sounds good, as do others. And we can see them in your book, The Sleep Fix. Diane Macedo, thanks very much for writing it. Can't wait to see you back here. Good night.
No, have a good night's sleep, <laughs> Diane. Tonight. I will, Sweet dreams, sure. everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Diane. And tomorrow, Diane will be back with sleep doctor Michael Gr Gardner, uh, Grandner, excuse me, to answer some of your sleep questions. So that's tomorrow. Your questions on sleep and Diane and the doctor will answer them. I'm Terry Moran. Thanks for joining us. The news continues on ABC News Live with context and analysis. I'll see you back here at 3 p.m. Have a great day. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.